All right. <laughs> He's on his own. <laughs> Lock the door. Lock the door. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning and we just thank you for, for who you are and for what you are. Uh, Lord, you're the, the creator of all, all things, all, all the things that we see, all the things that we touch, all the things that we enjoy each and every day. Lord, you are the creator of all those things. Lord, we just, we thank you for, for that, but we also thank you that you love us, that you care about us, us just a speck on this earth that you you want us to have a relationship with you, and Lord, we thank you for that. You, you, uh, you come after us even if we don't want to be found. You, you still seek us, and we thank you for that. Lord, we know that there are people in our community that are hurting today. We know that people that are that are sick, and Lord, we know that you, you know each one of those situations. You, you understand what's going on, um, and we we trust you, Lord, that you will make the best. Of each one of those situations. Lord, I just want to lift up this service. I pray that um, things are being said here, the songs that are being sung, the, uh, the things that are going on in this service, Lord, we pray that it would be glorifying to you. We pray that it would be your words, it would be your actions. We pray that you would um, understand how much we love you. That's, a, that's our, our goal. And Lord, we also pray that that if there are people here today that, that don't know you as well, Lord, that they, they would grow to know you better and know that, uh, that we're not all here because we're perfect, that we have it all together, that we're here because we're hurting, we're here because we're broken, we're here because we need you, Lord. So, Lord, we just pray today that you would uh, be with us. We love you, and it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day. Um, I was sitting there last night, I was working on um, the message, and I thought, you know what, I really hadn't addressed Father's Day. Boy, this is weird right here. Did you? Yeah. I might trip and fall. That, that would be ugly. <laughs> Trying to get up is the worst part. Um, anyway, I um, was thinking about Father's Day, and I had remembered I had done a thing about six years ago for fathers and children, and I thought, well, I'm going to pull that out and look at that and just see, and there's some Proverbs and some just some little challenges that I have uh, for our fathers and for the children today. And I told the guys earlier, I messed up. I printed my notes in too small of a font. I was wearing my glasses when I printed my notes so I could read them. So now I'm going to have to have my glasses on. But um, anyway, I want to start off by telling you a little story about a gentleman. He took his son to the zoo and they're walking around. They're looking at all the animals and the dad's telling them about the animals. Well, they get to the tigers and the dad goes, man, these tigers are ferocious. They are mean. You know, if they, if they get out of this pen, they could eat us. You know, and, he, and the little boy goes, dad, he said, well, if that tiger gets out and he eats you, and he stops and he's just thinking, you know, he's in deep thought. And the dad goes, oh, I probably pushed this too far. He goes, well, dad, he said, now which bus is it that I need to take to get home? <laughs> <laughs> so he's more worried about how he's going to get home if dad's eaten by the tiger. But anyway, children, my challenge is for you is um, honor your fathers. Exodus 20, 12 tells us we need to honor our, our mother and our father. And you know, um, my dad went through some rough times. My mom passed away when she was 45. And after that, he went through some hard times. He really fell away. And he was not easy to love. And I was really struggling with it, you know, because I was uh, just become a Christian and I... I didn't know how to handle that. And where I fell on that was Exodus. And it just said, honor your father. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And it, didn't, and it doesn't mean that our fathers are always going to be right. It doesn't mean that our fathers are going to do everything that we want them to do. They're not going to be perfect, but we are called to honor them. And, and I know some of you are out there saying, yeah, but you don't know my dad. You, know, you don't know my dad. But the, the truth is, it doesn't say your dad has to be honorable. It just says we have to honor them. Next thing is, listen to your fathers. Children, I mean, we're all children. We need to listen to our fathers. Proverbs 13.1 says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker doesn't listen to rebuke. Proverbs 
listen to the advice and accept instruction, and in the end, you'll be wise. Basically, people, we, our fathers have been there and they've done that, whether we want to admit it or not. They have. They've walked the roads that we're walking. They're just trying to help us make, not make the same mistakes they made. So listen to our fathers. Love your fathers. In my background, with education, with working at a youth home, with camp, we see hundreds of kids, or I've seen hundreds of kids that didn't have a father. Love the father that you have. Might not be perfect, you might be what you thought he should be, but love him because there's a lot of kids out there that don't have that father. I can remember in high school, my parents never missed a football game, basketball game, a track meet. They were there all the time, and it bothered me. Every time, my dad's telling me what I could have done better. You know, I thought, this is horrible. I, here's what you should have. had a great game, but you know, you, should, you missed this tackle, you did this, or whatever. So I was, I was upset, and I was kind of venting, you know, after my dad walked off the field, and the kid came up to me and goes, you know, you shouldn't do that. And he, I'd, I'd grown up with him. He said, my dad's never been to one of my games. My dad could care less. And I thought, wow, that's, it hit me. It's like, I need to, you know, at least appreciate the father that I have. All right, dads, here's your challenge. Be an honorable man. So we're going to see a little pattern here. Be an honorable man. Be an example for your children. Be strong in your integrity and honest. Our children are always watching us. No matter what we do, they're always watching. When we do good or when we do bad, they're going to remember that. Listen to your children. See, there's this father. Him and his son were eating supper. And as they're eating their supper, their son goes, Hey, Dad, hey, Dad, is it good to eat bugs? And he goes, Hey, son, we don't talk about bugs at supper. We don't, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So a little later, the dad went up and said, Hey, did you have a question about bugs? And he goes, No. He said, uh, uh, There was just a bug in your soup, and he's gone now. So, <laughs> so really, it didn't really matter. But sometimes we do need to listen to our children. You know, they might have some wisdom there. Um, love, your, love your children. And, and this one's kind of, I mean, this is more for people that have, don't have adult children. I have some adult children now, and it's a little different with them. There is a relationship there, a friendship, but love your children enough to not be their best friend. And I know that sounds crazy, but love them enough not to be their best friend. Because in our society today, what we've seen in school and youth home and everything, everybody wants to be their kid's friend. They don't want to hold them to a high standard, and they're afraid to damage their self-esteem. And it, it, it's, it's actually the opposite. The less we do to discipline our kids, the, the worse they become. So Proverbs 19, 18, it tells us this in the Bible. It says, discipline your son, for if there is any hope, do not let, or, or do not be willing to party to his death. I mean, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. You know, we're, we, discipline is important in our family, but I didn't know that it was going to affect their, their life. And it's not. It's not talking about their life on earth. It's talking about their eternal life. And if we don't get things straightened out, it doesn't matter what they do here on this earth. It's their eternal life that we're concerned about. Um, Proverbs 23, 13, 14, don't, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> Somebody thought you like, that's a pretty... I mean, if you, if you spank your kid, they're not going to die, right? I mean, it's just that's basically all there is to it. Punish them with the rod and save their soul from death. So anyway, love your children. Love them enough to discipline them. And finally, the last proverb I had for, for Father's Day, and I, just, I think if we as fathers could, um, if we can hear this, I know it will make us, uh, if, if we get to the point with our children that they can, we can see these things, then uh, it would be just perfect. Uh, Proverbs 23, 15, 16. My son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad. In or My innermost being will rejoice when your lips speak, or what your lips speak is right. And that, and that all we want as fathers, we just want our kids to do what's right. We just want our kids to know the truth and to be wise. So that's all I have for Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to you guys and and I appreciate you all, all you fathers. And I know it's a, um, you know, later on I'll, I'll talk to a little bit about some of the, we've, we've had 30 plus kids at the youth home. So um, I am not 
by any means a perfect father, that's for sure. Um, but I appreciate you. Today, when I talked to Chad, Chad asked me to come and preach, and I didn't really know what I was going to preach on. I know that he's, he's going through the New Testament, and I am, I am a teacher by trade, but I am not a teacher like Chad. Chad is an amazing teacher. When he gets up here, um, I can just soak it right in. I'm sure you all do too. He's so knowledgeable. Um, he, 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 uh, he teaches us. Well, I probably won't do that for you guys today. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I thought that um, I was approached, and I don't know if it was Ron or Sharon or maybe it was Gary. Ken, I don't know. Somebody last week or the week of camp came up to me, and, and maybe it was none of you, and he said, how did you and your family get to Camp Galley? I mean, what? how did you get there? And, and I thought, you know what? I've never really given uh, my testimony to you folks. And I thought maybe... Um, if you can stay awake, um, I would like to do that today. I'd like to offer you my testimony, and I, and I hope that I don't want it to be about me at all, because um, God has worked huge things in my life um, to get us to a full-time ministry, and, um, and where, where we came from and where the, the, the things that we've gone through to get to where we're at, I, I, God has done those things. And, all, and so I even if I'm saying me and I, please understand it's, it, there's nothing that has been done that God has not had his hand on. And uh, so anyway, I grew up in a small old church in Easton, Kansas. Uh, I say I grew up in church. I, we went to church. We were Easter and Christmas, and every once in a while my family would get all ramped up and we'd go for a few weeks at a time. Uh, it was a little Methodist church. Uh, we never prayed together as a family. I never remember praying unless we were at church. Never prayed for a meal. Uh, my dad didn't want to go to church. My mom did all the time. So there was a constant battle. I wanted to be with my dad. I didn't want to be in church. And so it was a constant battle to go to church. That's kind of the way I grew up. We got into high school, same thing. I was running, just like most teenage kids, running hard, and, and uh, but yet going to church every once in a while. So I was starting to live and develop this double life. At church, I was a good kid. I acted good because I knew I'd get my rear end whipped if I didn't act good at church. And that was really the only reason. When I wasn't at church, I lived like hell. I had a point blank. That's what we did. You know, it was Sundays, and then the rest of the week, not so much. And that was okay because that's the way my family, that's the way we were. I mean, all of us. It wasn't just me. It was, that was how I was raised. And uh, we got in high school. My sister went on a mission trip. And uh, I went to go down with my dad to pick her up from the mission trip. We went to Kansas City. And it was a Methodist thing. We, they went to somewhere in Tennessee. And I went to help pick her up. And when I got there, there were all these pretty girls that went on this mission trip. And I thought, you know what, next year I'm going on a mission trip. <laughs> and, and I know that, but that's, I want you to know where I was. That's all, all I was thinking about were girls and having a good time and seeing a new place. So sure enough, the next year I was on the mission trip. And what's crazy is I was a junior in high school. Jody was a sophomore in high school, and we met on that mission trip. Now, <laughs> I like to say we just lived happily ever after, and you know we, we got together or whatever, but I never saw her again for three more years. We were on the same work crew. We weren't a couple. I had a girlfriend, maybe two. <laughs> I had one at home and one on the trip. You know, uh, yeah, it was not good. It was not good. I didn't go for the right reasons. I enjoyed San Antonio. I don't even remember serving. I, don't, I think we painted, but it was not my. It was not what I was there for. I was just there to have fun. And uh, three years later, didn't know where I wanted to go to college. I knew I didn't want to work in a factory my whole life. And so I had went to work in a factory right out of high school. And, and I thought I didn't want to do that anymore, so I, I quit and went to college. First day on campus, who do I meet? Jody. You know, we're both four and a half hours away from home. We both end up at the same college. And here it goes again with my double life. So I start hanging around Jody. She had a boyfriend. I had to work on that. Had to get him out of the picture. But uh, she started inviting me to Bible studies 
and fellowship of Christian athletes. And then I'd go and play with the football or run with the football guys, you know, and played football. And I was living two different lives again. But I was really pretty darn good at it because she married me. You know, a couple years later, we got married. And honestly, that's the hardest part to talk about because, man, I think I'm going to get emotional. Um, because I successfully took somebody that loved the Lord in over six years. <clears throat> we didn't go to church. She wasn't studying the Bible anymore. She wasn't going to church. And that's my fault. I didn't know that. I wasn't, you know, I was just living life. But I took somebody that loved the Lord and successfully took them away from the church. I was a pretty good man, wasn't I? Pretty big man. Married, married this woman who thought I was a Christian and took her out of the church. Well, then we were blessed, and uh, our oldest daughter came along. <laughs> Golly, what's wrong with her? Stayed up too late last night. <clears throat> um, our oldest daughter came along, and here I am, a big man again. I, I have to... Uh, I have to get, I started having this feeling that, man, I've got to get her to church. And thank God for that. I mean, God, that's, I know God was in my life because he was telling me, I've got to get this kid in church. And, you know, the big man that I am, I was going to let somebody else do that. So I'll, I'll take her to church so they can teach her about God. I know what I need to know. That's kind of my mentality. I knew that Jesus was there. I knew that he died for my sins and that's all I needed to know. I didn't need to go every Sunday to church. I didn't need to be involved but I could take her to church. And where I was, and Jody can contest this, we lived in a small town. There was a Methodist church and there was a Christian church. And I was Methodist because that's what I grew up. I was Methodist and she was going to a Christian church at the time when we got married. And she said, I really think we need a Christian church. I said, here's the deal. Whichever one starts later is the church we're going to go to because I want to sleep in as long as I can because I'm not going to waste my whole Sunday at church. And we get there, and thank God, the Christian church started it 30 minutes later. So that's where we end up going. I walk in, and there's a young preacher. He's about my age. We're in our 30s, early 30s. And uh, <clears throat> he saw right through me. And I know God God was telling him to, to work on me. But he never, he never really confronted me. He just saw through me. He knew I was, I was fake right from the start. And uh, he kept pushing me and kept pushing me. And and he goes, hey, Charles, one day, he said, you're a, you're a teacher, right? And I said, yeah, I teach. And he goes, well, you know what? This summer, I'm putting on a summer camp, and I need you to come and be a counselor. And I said, no. I said, I got into education, so I got my summer off. I don't care about the kids. I just want my summer off. Nobody reacted to that. Okay. <laughs> you believe that? <laughs> anyway, I, that's, that's really my intention. I wanted to play all summer long, and I did not want to do anything, especially not church-related. Um, I was good enough I was going to take my daughter. Um, but here I am living that double life. I can't not say yes, right? Because if I say yes, then I look like a bad guy. And so I have to tell him yes, so I do. He said, don't worry. I'll have everything written out. You just teach like you teach at school. You'll have your lessons. You'll have everything, and it'll be easy. So I get there and uh, got third and fourth graders from hell. Um <laughs> Ron, you thought you had them bad. This, kid, this group, the first day a kid ran away. I mean, ran away. And we had to, uh, that guy was, that kid was ornery now. I'm telling you, he was ornery. But anyway, it was bad. We, we went through the day. We finally got settled down. I taught my lessons. I did my thing. We had our meals. You guys know the routine. Nighttime, put them to bed. And these, that was one good thing. They did go to sleep. And once they went to sleep, it was tradition at this camp that all the counselors went down to the cafeteria and kind of sit and talk. Well, I did not want to do that. I'm not going to sit around and talk about Jesus. I, I'm just going to go to bed. Well, I go to my room. I can't sleep. It's Austin Turner. Never, never slept a wink. Well, you know, when you're 29, 30 years old, usually you can sleep. You don't have any, I didn't have any problem doing that. I could not sleep at all. So Sunday night, no sleep. Monday, we did the same routine. Got them through their lessons, taught my lessons, got them through all their activities, got them to bed. I went down and tried to listen to some of this positive stuff about Jesus, and I couldn't do it, so I went to my room, couldn't sleep. Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I could not sleep a wink at all. We get to Wednesday, and I am ticked off. 
So I get the kids in bed. I go down to the cafeteria. I stay up until all those guys are gone. And I am mad. And I start cursing God. I said, you know what, God? I gave up a week of my life to be here. I did. I gave up a week of my life. And you can't let me sleep? I mean, this is ridiculous. And I'm mad. I mean, I am, I am furious. So you can imagine Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, no sleep. I, I'm on edge. There's a Bible within about four feet of me. I take that Bible and I throw it in the cafeteria. It hits the wall and falls on the table. And you know how, I mean, maybe you don't know how, but um, hopefully you don't. But when you're mad and you have a little moment to calm down, you think that was pretty stupid. You know, I'll go get the Bible. And I walked over. It was open. And this is what it said. First thing I see, 1 John, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all of our sin. And right then, I stopped. And I asked Jesus into my life, or at that moment. And I'd like to tell you that my life was, oof, just roses after that. But it wasn't, but it, it made me realize, he hit me right where I needed to be hit. I was a liar. I was lying to my wife. I was lying to my kids. I was lying to God. He knew it. And, and you know, you might think that's freaky that that happened, but it really, I think that's the only thing that would stop me from living that way was to hear these words. And it didn't just all of a sudden turn around. Actually, it was harder. Because I'm telling you, if you're living the way I was living, and some people are, there are people probably in this church that might be living the way I was living right then. Because we've grown up with it. It's become normal. But Satan has us right where he wants us. He had me right where he wanted me. See, because I, I was claiming to be a Christian. I was living the way I wanted to. He, he had me. He didn't have to work on me anymore. Because he had me. And more than likely, he was going to have my kids, too, if I didn't change. And the truth is, <clears throat> the more I was convicted of my sin, the more the sin removed from my life. And it was, it was amazing. I, if, if I sinned, if I said a cuss word, or I was like, oh, man, I can't say that. And it was about, I don't know, that was in June or July, and we had a yearly... Uh, We'd go out with two of our friends, um, the married couple, and Jody's birthday is on the 4th of February, and her birthday is on the 14th. So we'd always go out for a Valentine's dinner. We go into the restaurant, we sit down, and we eat our meal. We come out, get in our car, and we start to go home. And I said, Jody, I said, did you hear how they were cussing? Like every other word, even the F word. And I said, is that, I said, was, was I like that? And she goes, Charles, you were worse than them. And I was like, I can't, I couldn't believe that. But God had convicted me and started to change me. And, and I realized that I needed to do, be better. And so we, we started a Bible study at our church. And, it, and I recommend it. I mean, it's old. How many years has that been, Jody? 20 plus years. But we went and started to go through the, the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. And uh, my kids are always on me because if I preach a sermon, I can guarantee you, what's the verse, Cassie? Romans 12. Or that's the chapter. But Romans 12 is going to be in some sermon because we, we studied that. And this is what Romans 12, the first verse of Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and perfect will. 
And that's what we wanted. We, Jody and I, we began to pray together, and we began to say, you know, what does God want us to do? And we didn't know. We didn't know what he wanted to do. So, so how did we test it? We offered up our bodies. We offered up our service. We started volunteering at the church. We started vo- volunteering at the camp. Um, when we volunteered at the camp, we met a missionary who was building houses and churches in Mexico. We began going to Mexico in the summers and building, building. And I'm not saying this stuff to brag. I'm just telling you this is where God, how God works. We got to, the, to doing those Mexico trips. And then we end up going back to the camp because they needed a cook. So we cooked all summer long at a camp. And then a uh, representative, some representatives from the youth home came. And we're like, okay, that's, that's really cool. It kind of fits in what we do. We teach, we coach. Um, we, 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 we've always talked about how we could have an, a bigger influence on the kids that we teach. And here's our opportunity to go to a youth home and work with these kids. We went to the, to the youth home from there. And it just, one thing led to another and led to another. And that's what God's telling us. If we just start, if we just offer up our, our bodies, if we offer up our service, it doesn't have to be huge. It'll start small and then it's going to grow. I mean, poor Sharon. She came one time last year. She's been there all summer this summer. It's cooking, right? <laughs> See, Sharon, it's working. You know, but, but I'm just saying it, it continued to grow. And then from there, and, and, and you know, uh, when we went from teaching to the youth home, and I don't want to skip this part because this is God, this is amazing what God did. We walked in there and they said, okay, this is an exciting ministry. Now we are probably going to have to be compensated because we are both teachers. We're both working, teaching, coaching. We're making almost $100,000 a year. I was training horses. We, we, had, we were very, pretty successful financially. Hundred grand a year. We walk in there. She shows us we love the ministry, and she writes down on a little piece of paper, and she said, "Now don't open this till you're in the car, and until after you've prayed and talked about this opportunity. This is what she's going to pay us." We get in the car. We're excited. We we pray. We're driving. We open it up. Thousand dollars. Twelve thousand dollars for the year, plus our we could live in a house. That didn't cover our food. Um, I, there was a lot of food. <laughs> I knew you all were thinking of that, so I had to go ahead and address it. I wasn't quite this big back then. <laughs> anyway, um, so we had plenty. Um, but $12,000, we, we were deflated. We are like $100,000, $12,000. There's just no way. No way. Over 12-month period. Right, Jody? 12 months later, we were at that youth home. Because God started to say, you don't need this. Sell this. Get rid of that. You don't need this in your life. You don't, this isn't that important. And pretty soon, we, had, we were sitting there with all the boxes surrounding us in this little house. And we had $500 worth of debt that I didn't know how we were going to pay it off because our house still hadn't sold. We had an $800 mortgage, $1,000 income, and we're sitting there with a $500 debt. I, told, I called the doctor's office because it was a doctor bill. It was probably Cassie. Um, she was the source of most of our medical bills. But uh, um, she's always jacking around, you know. <laughs> no. Um, 500 bucks. And I didn't know what we were going to do because it was probably going to take us two years to pay that $500 off with what extra money we had. We're at the youth home. There's a church that comes in on a mission trip to the youth home. I didn't know it. It was a friend of mine from high school. He was now the pastor of, the, of this church. That evening, it was about 9 o'clock. Probably going to get emotional again. He walks and knocks on the door. And he goes, hey, Charles, my wife and I were just talking. We got a little bit of extra money. And um, I hadn't said anything to anybody. Um, he goes, we got 500 bucks, and God said, you need it. And we didn't have any debt when we started. It showed me. I mean, that's, God works. You know, God when he wants us to serve and he wants us to do those things, he'll make a way for it to happen. Same thing when we go to from show me, then we're, we, we move into different roles. Assistant director there. Jody's the school administrator. We've got, we're, we're, you know, it's a $2.5 million a year uh, ministry. Um, I have 40 people working for me eventually there. 
And uh, we get to know Mike House through sports. And we realized that that group of people had come together and bought that camp. And they were asking me, hey, how do you promote this? How do you do this? And every time we'd meet down in Joplin because of sports, and uh, there was an opening. They, the, the director left. And he, he, he didn't really even call us. We just thought, you know, that's pretty cool. Maybe we should look into that because we, we both, I, obviously I love camp. I have a soft spot for camp because I was saved at camp. But, you know, it was hard because you don't just leave what we had been doing. And uh, uh, we came up, we looked around, and again, it was the same situation. Uh, they said, well, this is what we can offer. And we're like, oh, boy, I have two girls in college now. You know, I got Trey, who was my 40-year-old surprise. Um, there's just no, no way we can switch and come to Galilee. And about two weeks late, we loved it. I said, I'd love to be on your board. I'd love to help with that kind of thing and help you in any way I can. I'll drive down as much as I can and help. About two weeks later, they said, now, if, let's just take the money out. Would you guys want to come to Camp Galilee? Forget about the money. And I said, oh, absolutely. We, we'd love to come here and, and help. And he said, well, we're going to do it. We're going to see what we can do, and you see what you can do. And so we, we said, we're going to pray, and we're going to take two weeks. We're going to figure out what we can do, and you figure out what you can do. And Jody and I, we, we said we really did want to take on this ministry. And, and so we put the pencil to it. It was the absolute bottom that we could even afford to come here. And he calls me up, and he said, have you, have you figured anything out? And I said, yeah, have you? And he goes, and he told me the amount. And I said, have you been talking to Jody? I said, have you already talked to Jody? And, 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 and he goes, no. And I said, that's the exact amount. So I'm telling you guys that God, God works, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and um, so the question was asked, how did, how did you and Jody and your family end up at Camp Galilee? And I'm going to tell you, it's like this. You know, when you're trying to get into the water in a pool for the first time and it's First time before the year, maybe you think it's going to be cold, right? What do we usually do? We kind of stick our toe in there. If we want to swim, though, really bad, because it's hot outside, I want to swim, but I know that water's cold, so I stick my toe in there. Next time, I might stick, stick it in, swirl it around a little bit, splash a little bit. That's what we did. We kind of stuck it. We started serving. We started offering our bodies as sacrifices and, and, and serving Next thing you know, we're sitting on the edge of the pool and we got our legs dangling in the pool, right? And, it, and it's, it's getting a little more comfortable. You know, pretty soon, the next thing we knew, we were just all the way in. And God was there all the way. And so, I don't know where you, you all are at with your, your walk. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. God is working on you right now. God has a plan. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or you're 85 years old, God has a plan and has a purpose for your life. I have, I have volunteers out at the camp that are in their 80s that come out there and can work me under the table because they know they're, they're serving and they're just giving. So there's, there's something for each one of us. And I'm going to leave you with this. It's Philippians 2, and it's uh, verses 1 through 5. It says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. So you're united with Christ. If you have any encouragement for that, if you have any comfort from His love, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit, if you have any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of self, selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only at your own understanding, but also the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just thank you. We thank you for seeking us. Lord, we, uh, I heard I heard a preacher the other day say on, on the radio, he said, uh, can you today surrender everything to Jesus? And Lord, I just pray that we would. I pray that, 
we can answer that question, yes. We can surrender our lives. We can surrender our money. We can surrender our things to serve you. It's because of what you've done for us, Lord, that we can do that. So I just pray that we would do that. We would offer ourselves up as living sacrifices, that this would be our worship to you in view of what you've done for us, the sacrifices you've made for us. Lord, we love you. We, we praise you. We, don't, we can't comprehend all the things that you've done, but we, we're so thankful for it. Lord, I pray that you be with each person here today. I thank you for the fathers. I thank you for um, this church who has brought us in, who has loved us, who has cared for us. Lord, you are an amazing God, and we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.